And we're moving on uh, to Zoeb Chivaji. Uh, Zoeb and I actually did our PhDs together uh, in Edinburgh um, in Jais Hardingham's lab. Um, but uh, unlike me, uh, Zoeb is actually a, a trained uh, uh, MD. Uh, he did his training in, in Oxford and in, in Cambridge uh, before starting his MD PhD uh, in Edinburgh. Um, and um, he's going to show us some uh, beautiful uh, data today from his Nature Commons paper uh, in looking at astrocyte uh, um, transcriptomic signatures in different mouse models of AD and identifying sort of uh, potential antioxidant uh, target pathways. Um, and so we'll take it away. Hi, thanks, Philip, for a great introduction. Um, hopefully, you can see my slides and hear me okay. Um, and thanks to Jerry for the, the Open Box Science team for giving me a chance to present our work here today, um, which was published just earlier this year. Um, I, th I think the Open Box aim of trying to open up science and spread new ideas is, is really fantastic. Um, and publication is open access. So hopefully, Everyone can have a look at the paper itself. And today I was going to really try and present the story kind of in an accessible summary in a way that I hope is interesting to anyone joining this talk who may come out with from the GLIA or even the neuroscience community. And hopefully it'll generate some discussion at the end. Um, and first, I also want to just start actually by acknowledging all the people and different teams that contributed to this work. So I think whilst I'm lucky to kind of be here speaking with you guys today, um, the work in this paper really represents a genuine equal multi-lab international collaboration kind of wide group of researchers from the university of edinburgh but also from the johnson lab at the university of wisconsin and madison and I've hopefully i've highlighted kind of all the key members involved in the project here today so first an introduction to the problem um so i think everyone knows what dementia is however i'm still astounded and actually slightly depressed by the scale of the problem um, both as it is currently as well as what's forecasted over our lifetimes so in the UK, dementia is now again the biggest killer in the country. It was top for a number of years, but then got moved to second place by COVID. But then again, unfortunately, has reclaimed um, that unfortunate uh, number one spot. In fact, it's predicted that one in three people who are born today in the UK will suffer from dementia. And whilst these are UK figures, I think the problem really is a global one, which is going to cause an even ever increasing burden as our population ages. I think this figure shows another aspect of the problem. So the number of deaths from dementia have continued to rise whilst the, the, the deaths from other causes, uh, such as heart disease or stroke, have continued to fall. And I think this is one, due to one of the key special problems for dementia conditions, which is we still lack an effective disease-modifying therapy. In fact, every other one of the top 10 conditions has now got proven therapy or treatment, uh, but not so for dementia. And I think this really highlights the urgency by which we really need to kind of close the gap in our knowledge that exists and try and find a way to try and modulate this disease process. I think one of the problems I think, which Brendan so well kind of illustrated is that the brain is a complex organ. And I think when most people imagine the brain, they probably think of something like this. Now, this beautiful picture is from the Human Connectome Project. And imagine the brain is a kind of bunch of wires and connections I mean, these are obviously the neurons and neural pathways, which are, of course, the kind of electrically active cells in the, in the brain. But as Brendan, I think, illustrated so nicely, um, the brain isn't just made up of neurons, um, but instead, a lot of the brain is made up of another type of cell called glia, um, which basically provides an essential, healthy environment for the neurons to function. And, you know, these include things like oligodendrocytes, um, the vasculature, the resident inflammatory cells like the microglia, and finally, What's been the kind of focus of the talk of these talks has been the astrocyte, which is the most common glial cell in the brain. And looking back through my kind of um, kind of medical school notes, um, I recently kind of you know went back through them and, and confirmed that we actually had zero lectures dedicated to glia at all. So I think in the past people have kind of assumed that these cells were very little consequence to brain disease. But kind of I think something that's probably not unsurprising and recently it's becoming increasingly clear that these non-neuronal cells actually are very important, uh, both for healthy brain function uh, and for normal physiology, but also in diseases where they actually partake in important upstream and downstream cascades that ultimately contribute to neuronal and synaptic dysfunction. And I think Brenda's already kind of discussed some of the important functions of the cell that I'm interested in, which is the astrocyte. And certainly during health, they kind of play an ever emerging number of roles important for brain function. So they kind of are important to take up glutamate, uh, protecting the brain from glutamate toxicity. Uh, they're really important in, in synapse formation. They have an important role in providing metabolic energy support. 
And interesting for this talk, they're also one of the key cells involved in antioxidant homeostasis in the brain. And it's also clear that astrocytes change in disease. So this is one of the figures that's kind of from uh, one of the early drawings by Albert Alzheimer's himself over a century ago when he first described his eponymous condition. And as you can see, as he's really nicely kind of drawn here, that's the kind of things labeled GLZ, are the abnormal glia that's around the plaques that kind of define uh, this most common cause of dementia. And the diagram on the right is basically just a more modern picture showing exactly the same thing. And it shows uh, GFAP positive astrocytes, which are abnormal in nature uh, surrounding plaques. And this term, which I think Brendan's already discussed uh, quite well, is called reactive astrogliosis. And kind of emerging work, um, kind of including key findings from the late Membaras, as well as some cool recent studies by Philip and his mentor Shane, um, it's becoming increasingly clear that reactive astrocytes do not come in one flavor, but instead can develop very different responses uh, depending on the nature of the initial insult. For example, in response to acute inflammation, um, it's been proposed that astrocytes um, develop these features which are potentially uh, neurotoxic. And as Brendan has kind of talked about, you know, involved in potentially secreting toxic substances and uh, kind of activating complement and destroying synapses. But in uh, response to other acute insults, um, in this case, uh, for example, ischemia, they may develop other features which may be broadly neuroprotective in, feature, uh, in response. But of course, these findings are only in context of acute injury. And we were quite curious as to what happens to astrocytes in response to chronic neurodegenerative processes, and specifically in response to Alzheimer's disease pathology. Um, for example, would the response uh, be dominated by either of these arms or would it be something completely different? So the hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease are these defining pathological findings um, of intracellular tau tangles, uh, which are made up of uh, abnormally phosphorylated tau protein, which is a microtubule protein involved in normal function, as well as the presence of extracellular beta amyloid plaques. And we thought it'd be interesting to see how these two separate pathologies, which define Alzheimer's disease, influence astrocytes, and whether there are any similarities or differences. So we model these pathologies using two separate mouse models. Um, now I'm not gonna go into too much detail in this talk about these models today, but in brief, to model tauopathy, we used the mapt p 301 s model, which was um, first developed by Michel Godot, which expresses a human tau mutation, exon 10, uh, which basically leads to early onset phosphatide accumulation and front central dementia. And it's found in families that basically get early onset dementia in the 50s. Um, and it, it, in the mouse, it causes age-dependent, region-specific phosphatide accumulation, which then drives progressive synapse loss and neuronal death. And to model amyloidopathy, we use the APP-PS1 mouse. And this is a double transgenic uh, mutation, which once again leads to progressive age-related plaque deposition uh, in the cortex and hippocampus, which in turn again drives synaptic loss and cognitive impairment. So using these two separate mouse models, we asked what are the transcriptional changes occurring in astrocytes in response to these two pathologies over time? Now, one of the challenges, of course, we had to overcome was how do we separate the gene expression changes happening in astrocytes from those that are also happening separately in all the other cells of the brain? And we decided to do this in this project using a method called trap sequencing. So some of this is quite a neat technique, which uses a transgenic mouse that expresses GFP tag ribosomes only in astrocytes. And this is achieved through the use of uh, an astrocyte specific LDH1 L1 promoter. And therefore, we can uh, immunoprecipitate using anti GFP coated beads ribosomes only from astrocytes, along with the attached um, actively translated mRNA. And then by sequencing that mRNA, we get an insight into astrocyte specific translation. And as you can see, this method very nicely enriches strongly for astrocyte specific genes and depletes for signature markers of other cell types. So what do we find using this method? Well, unsurprisingly, both tauopathy and beta amyloidopathy have a profound effect on astrocyte transcription. In this graph, each red dot is a gene that's significantly upregulated, and each blue dot is a gene that's significantly downregulated. And as you would also expect, these changes relate to the age of the mouse and severity of disease. There are very few changes to astrocytes in early disease where there's very little astrogliosis, um, but this leads to then tens of thousands of genes changing in advanced disease um, in both amyloidopathy and tauopathy. 
So having got this data, we then compared the genes to pre-published data sets to see if this gives us any more insight. First, since age is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, we looked at how these changes compare to those seen in aged mice. We used published data sets of the aging astrocyte translatome, um, which compared 10 week old mice with 24 month old mice. And what we found was significant enrichment for genes that are changed older mice with our gene sets from both pathologies. Now, whilst I think the classical view of Alzheimer's disease as purely an external form of aging probably does not hold up completely scrutiny, I think the fact that the molecular response of astrocytes to both tau and A beta pathology overlaps with their response to aging is consistent perhaps with the idea that aging brain is an environment that's compromised in similar ways. Next, we want to see whether the transcriptional changes that we saw in astrocytes in response to tau or beta amyloid resemble any of the acute changes that were described earlier in response to LPS and ischemia. And what we found was that both pathologies did not induce changes consistent with either acute LPS or acute ischemia, but instead had characteristics of both signatures, hence suggesting a more complex heterogeneous response. So whilst the previous data did demonstrate there was significant overlap in astrocyte responses in amyloid and tau, we also did find some differences between the two different pathologies. One interesting area that I want to highlight here is that is when we looked at um, AD-associated risk genes as identified by GWAS studies. Now, these studies have found an increasing number of AD risk loci, and many actually genes that are highly expressed in astrocytes. And therefore, we looked at the degree these risk genes were enriched in our tau and amyloid data sites using a method um, similar to one used on microglia in a paper published by Mark Beers and Bartlett Stupa. And this basically uses sequential relaxing of the p-value cutoffs to include more sub-threshold risk genes. And what we found was that this maintained significant enrichment down to quite low values in amyloidopathy, but in contrast, in tauopathy, uh, do not achieve significance at any value. I think this observation raises the possibility that the astrocyte-centered risk, genetic risk, may influence the response to early A-beta pathology rather than tau, and thus possibly place the genetic risk downstream of the amyloid pathway, but upstream of tau pathway. This is similar to what's been suggested in microglia, and I think it would be quite interesting to kind of study further. Using the data sets, we also performed gene ontology analysis. And what we found was that there was upregulation of both deleterious responses. This included upregulation of gene sets for apoptosis and inflammation of cis genes, as well as downregulation of metabolism, mitochondrial health, um, and photosynthesis genes. But interestingly, we also saw evidence of significant upregulation of pathways associated with adaptive protective responses too. So to better understand what the mediators were the trans responses, we carried out transcription factor binding site studies to look at what regulators might be enriched in our gene sets. And what we found was significant enrichment for genes driven by an important cytoprotective factor called NRF2. In fact, we found that of the core A-beta and tau-induced astrocyte genes, nearly 30% of these were actually driven by NRF2 in astrocytes. This is a nearly a six-fold enrichment of a chance and very suggestive that the NRF2 transcription factor is indeed part of a core response to astrocytes to AD pathology. So NRF2 is actually a very well-studied master transcription factor. Classically, it regulates a host of antioxidant genes, which regulates antioxidant homeostasis in the brain. Here, antioxidant stress leads to NRF2 separating from its adapter protein KEEP1. This then allows it to translocate into the nucleus where it then, by binding to ARE transcription sites, uh, upregulates a battery of antioxidant genes. And these gene responses serve to both detoxify the intracellular environment, this could be in astrocytes, but also lead to secretion of factors that um, detoxify the extracellular environment, as well as providing antioxidant precursors that boosts antioxidant resilience in nearby neurons. Actually, beyond this role as an antioxidant regulator, there's also emerging evidence that NRF2 may play a wider role in regulating proteostasis and autophagy. And these may particularly be important in, of course, in these proteinopathy associated conditions. So we thought maybe this upregulation of NRF2 represented an adaptive protective response by the astrocyte to new degeneration. But of course, given that the disease still proceeds and our mice or patients still get dementia, maybe this response was something that was too little or too late to mitigate neuropathology. So therefore, we asked. Can enhancing the NRF2 pathway in reactive astrocytes confer neuroprotection? 
So we tested this by crossing our disease model lines with the GFAP NRF2 line. This line overexpresses NRF2 driven by the GFAP promoter, hence um, upregulating it specifically in reactive astrocytes. Now, to remind you that in the disease pathology line in the MAP TPGONS, the APPBS1 mouse, the pathology is expressed in neurons. And therefore, by upregulating NRF2 in reactive astrocytes, we really are looking here at non cell autonomous neuroprotective effects of astro pathways in these disease processes. So, what did we find? Well, first, starting with the tauopathy line, what we saw was overexpressing astro NRF2 led to both a reduction in phosphor tau deposition in neurons and also reverse neuron loss in a model, as you can see here by a rescue of the new end staining, which is lost in the BTO1S mouse model. Furthermore, overexpression of astro NRF2 also reversed whole CNS transcriptomic perturbation. So the red and blue dots in the, in the left are those genes, this time from the whole brain, that significantly change in tauopathy versus wild type mice. The further the crosses are from baseline, the greater the change. The levels of these genes with their retained colors is then shown on the right when astrocyte NRF2 is upregulated. And you can see how the expression of a large number of these genes returns back to baseline. And this neuropathological and transcriptomic rescue does translate into a functional benefit. The MAP PP3ONS mouse develops a progressive motor weakness, which can be scored, kind of time, how long it takes, and how quickly it falls off the horizontal bar. And what we found was that whilst the uh, standard p 2 s mice shows predictable decline that starts after 16 weeks. Um, when you overexpress NRF2 in astrocytes, you can delay the onset of that functional deficit. And the same is true in the amyloidopathy model. Again, overexpressing um, NRF2 in astrocytes rescues a pathological deficit. It leads to reduced amyloid plaque size and plaque area in both the cortex and the hippocampus. And similarly, or perhaps even more impressively than what we saw in the tauopathy mouse model, um, overexpressing NRF2 in astrocytes seems to reverse or rescue whole brain transcript, uh, transcriptional perturbation. And in keeping with the pathology and transcriptional changes, the mice have a reduced conch deficit. This time in this model measured using a fear conditioning memory test. And this can be seen here, overexpressing astrocyte NRF2 reverses the reduction in fear condition memory uh, which is the time taken for a percentage of mice to freeze in response to a sound stimulus that was seen in the disease model. So to conclude and summarize, we have found that amyloidopathy and tapathy induce distinct but overlapping signatures in astrocytes. And whilst there was evidence of deleterious signatures, we also saw evidence of a significant adaptive protective response in astrocytes, which was marked by upregulation of the cytoprotective factor, NRF2. But given the fact that the mycelial progressive disease, we hypothesized whether this was a response that was too little too late. And actually, boosting astrocyte NRF2 was able to reduce pathology, reverse transcriptional perturbation, and delay the onset of behavioral and functional loss in these mice models. And I think this highlights the potential for targeting astrocytes to improve the CNS environment to perhaps resist neurodegenerative progression. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that was interesting. As mentioned before, the work that went into this project really represents a collaborative effort, um, both from Edinburgh groups, as well as from the labs of Jeff and Dylan Johnson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and thank you again for letting me speak. Um, and I look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks, Soeb. What a, what, a, what, a, what a great talk. Um, again, if you have questions, as well, you can just type it in the chat uh, in, the, in the meantime. Um, you have, a, you have a question, Brendan? No. In the, in the meantime, in the meantime I'm, um, so, so the, the locus of the insult, right, between your APP mouse and your topathy mouse is very different. Both the type of insult and the locus of insult and what types of astrocytes it affects. But the, the reversal of the NRF2 overexpression has the same effects on, on, on both, um, in both disease phenotypes. So how, how why is NRF2 such a, so, such a strong candidate? Why does it, why does it yeah. treat both diseases equally? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I guess, you know, one of the things is that, and I kind of alluded to this, is that potentially, you know, whether it has a consequence on these common pathways that are in, involved in kind of clearing abnormal proteins, you know, which is both represent, you know, both the tauopathy and beta amyloidopathy represents, in essence, kind of downstream 
a failure of abnormal protein clearance um, in the brain um, in the CNS. Um, so whether my you know, in essence, it's kind of boosting the resilience of the brain to try and uh, deal with a proteinopathy. Um, you know that, that in essence it de delays the onset of ultimately neurodegeneration or synapse loss. Um, so you know that could be one one reason um, why it seems to have this effect. And certainly, boosting NRF two has been shown to have a benefit in models of Parkinson's disease, models of ALS. Um, so in all these kind of protein uh, proteinopathy conditions, um, it seems to be very protective in astrocytes. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, Gary Lynn is asking the question is what other cell types express NRF two and is it a draggable target? Yeah. That's a very interesting question. So starting with neurons, um, actually neurons express very low levels of NRF2. So this was some work done by Hardingham Lab that shows that during development, um, they epigenetically repress NRF2 expression. Um, so it's one of those things where if you try and target NRF2 in neurons, um, you often don't have, an, have a, a benefit. Um, but there was a, a recent paper from the Hardingham Lab where they de Desuppressed NRF2, epigenetic suppression NRF2 expression. And then if you target NRF2 in neurons, you can have a protective benefit. Um, in microglia, it is quite highly expressed. Um, and there is obviously a lot of work to try and target microglial NRF2, although the consequences, once again, are, are maybe may be different in different cell types. Um, the druggable thing's an interesting story. Um, so NRF2 drug targets have been tried. Um, antioxidant uh, things to try and improve antioxidant homeostasis in the brain. Have been tried. Um, a lot of drugs have failed. Um, now, that's that's. I mean, I can talk about that for ages. Um, but I guess in brief, it might be that we're targeting the wrong cell type, we're targeting at the wrong time, or that the drugs we're using to activate NRF2 themselves are very toxic. So, you know, I mentioned how NRF2 is activated by oxidative stress. A lot of these drugs are quite electrophilic and therefore create stress to activate NRF2. Um, there are some newer drugs that are coming on which kind of work in different ways, and it'd be exciting to see whether they have, they have a benefit. And we have a question uh, from Ranabir about sort of um, the, 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 the mechanism and basically wondering whether um, sort of the, the overall inflammatory state in the brain, particularly in the hippocampus, can be restored by NF2 overexpression, um, or does it affect BBB permeability? So, yes, yeah, so we've not looked at BBB permeability, actually. Um, that'd be interesting to look at. The inflammatory state, what we found was that it didn't affect the microglia. Um, so we looked at microglial activation um, and microglial uh, markers, and that didn't change, um, certainly in a crude way, but it did reduce the astrocyte reactivity. Um, so certainly the markers, so even when we overexpress NRF2 in astrocytes, um, the actual markers for astrocyte reactivity decreased, um, but we didn't see any crude reduction in inflammatory states. Um, but of course, this was just targeting astrocytes um, rather than a whole brain, you know, it, it didn't target inflammatory cells or that microglia. So I was actually wondering, so basically in your, in your APP mice, right? Yeah. What do you think drives the changes in gene expression? Is it, is it primarily the plaque deposition or are there sort of other factors that drive gene expression in astrocytes? Yeah, so something we're looking at now today is to look at the spatial location of, of where these abnormal astrocytes are and reactive astrocytes. Um, I assume it is related to plaque deposition and that, the, you know, it's because you see these reactive astrocytes around plaques. Um, you know, we've, the, you know, the next question we'd see whether these markers, you know, and, you know, you know using um, spatial transcriptomics or, or even using simple um, immunohistochemistry with these labels to see whether they're kind of upregulated near plaques. Um, that would be quite a, a nice next step to do. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think we still have five minutes. Um, is there any other questions, um, either for Zoe um, or for Brandon? Um, so do you, so wait, do, do, you see, I, do you think that sort of in your APP mouse, do you, do you think you have sort of different subtypes of activated astrocytes, or do you think it's just sort of locally around the plaques and no yeah. matter where it is in the brain, your astrocytes are going to be activated yeah. the so, same way, basically? So from our data set, that's like the next question, I guess, would be, we're seeing these different changes, you know, upregulation of protector responses and upregulation of harmful responses. Do these represent clusters of astrocytes or subtypes of astrocytes? Do these represent general responses across all astrocytes? We've done some single cell work. Um, and, you know, we certainly, it, you know, it's, it's always very hard a single cell because the depth is not as great. Um, 
So it, it's not that it's translating as easily as what we know. It's not that we've got, oh, yes, there are these deleterious astrocytes, which are all fitting really nicely with that deleterious population. And then the, um, the NRF2 astrocytes all really nicely. But what we are seeing is there is subpopulation astrocytes um, which seem to lose homeostatic functions, um, so, you know, which seem to lose uh, glutamate applicability. So there certainly are subpopulations. Um, and we haven't completely got a handle yet on exactly how this links with the data of the trap seek, which is, is a bit different from single cell work, which, which and I'm only kind of beginning to understand that myself actually um, at the moment. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, Tara is wondering whether you see any regional differences upon uh, NF2 overexpression. No. So, it, it is, so certainly when you look at, um, you know, HEMOX1 levels in the human brain or in mouse, you know, in, in the in response to AD pathology, that seems to be localized around plaques. Um, so the disease seems to be happening around processes around plaques. Um, so yeah, so it's, again, in that case, you know, if you're looking at that kind of level of expression, that, that there is a regional element to that. But the mice obviously different because the mice have got, you know, layer specific, the pathology is dictated by the mutation. Um, so in essence, where, where the pathology happens is where we get these responses. But in human Alzheimer's brains, it seems to be, plaque related where you get the application of these, of these molecules related to NRF2. Okay, we have two more minutes. Um, uh, uh, in the NRF2 overexpressing mice, the NRF2 is always being expressed. Can you intervene after plaque or um, plaques are already present? Or can you temporarily control NRF2 overexpression? Yeah, so I mean, you know, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, in, in these mice, we were hoping that as G, as the reactive asteroids became upregulated, which is G, GFAP is a big mark of reactivity, that the NRF2 will be upregulated in those reactive astrocytes. But certainly it's not something that we have looked at, which happened after the plaques were present. Um, and that, you know, that would be a really good question to try and work out whether, you know, whether it is something that you can, um, whether you can rescue. Um, you know, the other big question is whether in the normal brain, these pathways are all, all oversaturated already. So actually, even giving a drug, you know, we, we're always using transgenic methods to try and upregulate NRF2. But actually, in physiological state, the astrocytes already working as hard as they can to try and respond to these, this disease, and therefore there's no capacity left to uh, upregulate NRF2 anymore. Um, some recent works found that there may be keep one independent ways of targeting NRF2. Um, so it may be that even if the keep one antioxidant pathway is fully saturated, there may be other ways that we could potentially upregulate NRF2. And it'd be interesting to see whether, even after the plaques are formed, whether targeting those other ways that may not be saturated might be, uh, in, might, might cause benefit. That'd be an interesting area as well. All right, fantastic. So I think mm. we've reached the end of our seminar. And um, thanks again, Tobin and Brendan, it was fantastic. Uh, it's clear that we still have loads to learn about asteroid reactivity and asteroid substates and functional substates and so forth.